This episode is brought to you by The Jordan Harbinger Show. Do you want a new podcast to look forward to each week? One that's got it all, entertainment, information, and stuffed with actionable content? Yeah, you do. Because who wouldn't want to listen in as Jordan dives into the minds of fascinating people from athletes, authors, and scientists to mobsters and spies? Each week, Jordan uses his interviewing talents to bring you never-before-heard stories and insights to make life more understandable. He has one of the most highly rated self-development shows out there. Listen in, learn, and look forward to each new episode, like I do. And I would like to recommend a few episodes myself. The first one is episode 650, Brian Kloss, The Corruptible Influence of Power, and the other one is episode 585 with Timothy Snyder, 20th Century Lessons on Tyranny. Check them both out. You can't go wrong with adding the Jordan Harbinger show to your rotation. It's incredibly interesting. There's never a dull show. Search for the Jordan Harbinger show. That's H-A-R-B as in boy, I-N as in Nancy, G-E-R, on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. This episode is brought to you by Audible.com. As you know, Audible is the Internet's leading provider of audiobooks. With over 100,000 titles to choose from, everyone can find something to love. But for now, you can just try it for free with a free audiobook and a trial membership. You can go to worldwar2podcast.net or you can go to audibletrial.com slash ww2. Sign up for a free 30-day trial and select a free audiobook. I have recommendations, of course, but get what you like. They have a little bit of everything. So, this time, I would like to recommend Code Talker, the first and only memoir by one of the original Navajo Code Talkers of World War II. So, of the original 29 Navajo Code Talkers, this gentleman, Chester Nez, who's the author, is the last one left, and he decided to write down describing the inside story of his life and his service time in World War II. All the ratings from the Audible Reviews said it was fantastic, and I just started it myself, so I wanted to share it with you. Hello, and thank you for listening to The History of World War II, Episode 54, Pandora's Box. As we left the story back in Episode 52, Garing was pointing the tip of his spear toward the southeast corner of Great Britain. Luftlot 3, stationed in western France, transferred most of its fighters to Luftlot 2 under Kesselring, who was stationed directly across from Dover. He was expected to use the increased numbers of ME-109s and 110s to protect the JU-88 bombers and bring fighter command to battle. It was August 24, 1940, and Operation Sea Line was to be launched on September 17th. Fighter command, but especially 11 Group, run by Keith Park, was to be smashed to make way for the transports of German infantry and armor. They would cross over, disembark, and march on London to end all resistance in Western Europe. Gary might have had a romantic vision, at least in a fighting sense, of daring pilots in their ME-109s shooting the bulk of British fighters from the sky. But the man in charge was Kesselring. And though not a career airman, but certainly a solid general, he had a firm grasp of air strategy and was learning more every day. One of the things he learned was that sticking with a plan that focused on the enemy's aircraft and airfields would go a lot further to getting the job done. And he cleverly incorporated Gehring's orders of the 19th to be creative and to not simply use numbers to do his job. That would only lead to blunting the tip of the spear. Fighter Command had proven itself to him so, General Field Marshal Albert Kesselring proceeded to pull every stunt he could think of to create holes in the British radar chain, and thus expose their planes and airfields to attack. 
He mounted small raids, large raids, split formations, strafing, feints, multiple attacks, and anything else that came to mind as reports came back from returning sorties while he stared at a map of southern Britain. His intelligence information was still faulty, but he was getting smarter about which airfields were fighter commands and which were not. But through all this, it came down to Kesselring giving the British two options. Fighter Command could either send their planes up to defend their airfields, or their aircraft would be destroyed on the ground, along with their air bases. For him and for Park, it came down to that. But there was one more element to this struggle, and honestly, Kesselring had no idea it was playing out. As he was putting more pressure on Fighter Command, he unknowingly brought pressure on the sector stations, with his increased attacks starting on August 24th. He was beginning to hammer away at the very links that held Dowding's system of defense together. Each sector station controlled several airfields, and if that organization and their communications could be disrupted, then the Luftwaffe would not face the smaller but more focused British air power. That was what radar allowed them to do. That was their secret to remaining unoccupied. Back in July, the target had been the RAF, but after Garing's conference on the 19th, the bullseye was reduced to just fighter command. And by the third week of August, many of the buildings near airfields had been destroyed, but most of the staff had survived and were now billeted in nearby villages and towns. The major equipment was either undamaged or quickly repaired. Honestly, a downed power line kept an airfield offline longer than a cratered airfield. A low pass by a German reconnaissance plane might show destruction, fires, black smoke, craters, and undetonated bombs, but it would only be the last one mentioned that really mattered. As the launch date to Operation Sea Line was coming closer, Kesselring was stumbling into a more successful position, while Park's position was weakening but holding together. In the next three weeks, the RAF would lose more planes on average than they had been, and the Luftwaffe would lose on average less than they had been. And for all of the cutting-edge technology used during the Battle of Britain, with some dogfights being determined in mere seconds, the contest was now coming down to a slugfest. The question was, who would back off first? The weather on Saturday, August 24th, was only clear to the south, but that's all Kesselring needed. He didn't relish the idea of going north of London, because he would have to rely on his ME-110s, and they just weren't up to the job. He could send his prized 109s, but they could only stay there for about 10 minutes, then the red light of their fuel gauge would come on, letting them know that they had 15 to 20 minutes of fuel left, barely enough to make it back over the channel. So if he attacked too far north, his bombers would be shot down. But if he stayed to the south, he would lose fighters. The other side would too, but he was worried about himself, his men, and Garing's watchful eye. This battle had to end. The morning started off with the usual reconnaissance flights, but unless an amazing opportunity arose, Kesselring already knew what he wanted to do. He would go after Manston and Dover first. So around 10 a.m., Dover and the airfields at Hawkinge were shelled from the French coast. Then the bombers came. British fighters rose and drove them away, but not before damage could be done. A little after 10 a.m., JU-88s, Germany's medium-sized bombers, but the largest ones available to Kesselring, headed toward Manston. This much attacked airfield was about to be abandoned by fighter command. As the raid approached, the only squadron that could respond was 264, which was the last squadron of outdated Defiance still operating. The aircraft of 264 may have been obsolete, but their leader, Philip Hunter, was seen by most as invincible. He led his men up to engage the bombers 
and their escorts. A few German bombers and three defiants would not return home after clashing over the airfield, but the bombers' work was done. Every building was a wreck and on fire. Also, Hunter, the defiant leader, was last seen chasing a bomber back to France. Heroic, perhaps, but against Park's orders. The Raiders would return that afternoon at 3.30 p.m. and finish off Manston with their sixth attack there. Power had been lost, but was regained. But between the wrecked buildings, the cratered runway, and the scattering of unexploded bombs over the area, it was decided to leave Manston as an emergency landing strip only. Ramsgate was also hit by some of the Raiders, and a few RAF personnel were caught unawares by strafing. Like Manston, damage at Ramsgate was extensive. The gas works and a sulfur plant were destroyed, as well as a military headquarters and customs house. The civilians suffered too, as many houses were obliterated, along with the accompanying casualties. The pressure was tightening on fighter command. The remaining defiants, shaken by the loss of their squadron leader, were told to head for their new base of Hornchurch, which is just north of the Thames to the east of London. But what they couldn't know was that Hornchurch was another Kesselring target for the day. It was north of the Thames, but Kesselring was counting on surprise. The Germans were heading in Hornchurch's general direction, but veered at the last second and made straight for it. The Defiants got the call at the last minute and found themselves, once again, taking off as bombs from JU-88s were raining down on them. Two of the British fighters collided, trying to get airborne, and a third was shot down by an escorting ME-109. Hornchurch was battered, but intact. By 3 p.m. that afternoon, Kesselring considered the southeast appropriately softened up, and so launched at least 100 bombers and their escorts across Kent as they made for East London. They met with fierce resistance, but managed to get through. Parts of East London, like Upminster and Dagenham, were hit. Essex and North Weald, further to the northeast, were hit as well. At North Weald, the Germans had success in taking out the gas, electric, and water mains, as well as blocking Road A-122. Along with this strike, there were many casualties. An hour later, further to the west, the mobile reserve station at Bembridge on the east side of the Isle of Wight, detected invaders, but the plot was unclear. Still, 609 Squadron was sent up to about 5,000 feet by their controller. But by the time the British fighters arrived, the German bombers were already on their approach. So 609 Squadron found themselves between the ME escorts above and the AA guns below, trying to shoot them down. Between the shells coming up at them and the fighters diving down on them, they barely managed to escape. But, in getting away, Portsmouth was left open and attacked. The damage was intense and widespread. Rail services were offline again, and at least two destroyers were damaged. The German bombers also left 200 more people homeless. But they were the lucky ones. At least 100 civilian casualties were counted, with another 225 more injured. Kesselring ended his sorties for the day, feeling content. Now it was up to Sperla and his bombers of Luflot III to make sure the British did not sleep that night. Losses for the day were 22 for the RAF and 38 for the Luftwaffe. Total reported losses to date were 281 and 554, respectively. Later, as darkness came, it was time for safer bombing sorties to start. Fighter Command still did not have airborne radar, the one thing that would have really made a difference. So the bombers came on. Their accuracy would be off, but the vast majority of them would make it home. To cover as much of the lower half of Britain as possible, Many small and single bombers were sent out that night. Dozens of areas were hit 
as well as the northern, eastern, and western parts of London. This led many in the British government to think that the attacks on the capital were now deliberate and not simply strain mistakes. But most, if not all, of the hits within Greater London were mistakes. For example, a small group of Heinkels were looking for their target, the Thames Haven oil terminal. But between the clouds and the darkness, their bombs fell across East End. And just to give you an idea of the size of the attacks on London, the following places were hit by high explosive bombs that night. Millwall, Tottenham, Islington, Enfield, Kingston, Watford, Kennensbury Park, Highbury Park, Leighton, Woodgreen, and Hampton Court. But again, many other places were attacked that night as well, such as Birmingham, Devon, Bristol, Gloucester, Liverpool, Sheffield, Bradford, Hull, Kent, Hampshire, Reading, Oxford, Newcastle, Malden, Cardiff, and Buckinghamshire. By morning, at least 100 people were found dead, with a minimum of 335 more injured. Meanwhile, mines were being laid off Lyme Bay and by Weymouth to the southwest, with additional mines being dropped over the Thames Estuary, East Anglia, and North Foreland and Flamborough Head. The battle on the seas continued with no less than six steamers or tankers being sunk, with just over 100 crew men lost. Carrying items not only for civilian life, but to assist in Britain's war efforts, the pinch was being felt. That night, Sandy Sanders, an RAF pilot, had a rare nighttime kill and was congratulated by Keith Park. This was followed up with Sanders being elected to help develop night fighting tactics. He probably said, yes, sir, rather than mumbling something about dumb luck. On Sunday, August 25th, the weather was fair, but for those German pilots whose bombs landed within London the previous night, it was about to get much warmer. Gehring telegraphed all the commands who launched sorties last night and wanted to know the names of the pilots who attacked London. He wanted them transferred to the infantry immediately. The message was clear. Leave London alone. But events were already taking a new course that would soon remove control from the Reich Marshal's hands. That same morning, the War Cabinet in London ordered the first raid on Berlin. Meanwhile, Kesselring wanted to see how Fighter Command would react after his intense attacks of yesterday. So he ordered reconnaissance flights in the morning and sent out his fighters to fly along the Sussex coast. But Park ignored the invitation. Clearly, Kesselring was going to have to do more. Around 5 p.m. that afternoon, a large raid built up over the Cherbourg Peninsula and then headed for the RAF station at Warmwell in Dorset, to the west of White. Hoping to learn from their mistakes, the British pilots responded by flying higher than they were told to, to get a jump on the German bombers. But their numbers were too great, and some got through. Those bombers that were not forced back managed to hit a few hangars and the sick bay, And due to having to fight their way in, some of the bombers were forced off course which led to other targets in the far southwest being hit. As this was going on, another large raid built up over Calais, and a little after 6 p.m., the large formation of at least 100 aircraft headed across the channel to the southeast. As the bombers and their escorts neared the Thames estuary, they split. Half went to the north side, and the others headed for the Isle of Sheppey to the south. 32 Squadron, although exhausted, like every other pilot on both sides of this battle, responded. The defenders scored some victories, at least two bombers, but lost another one of their own. Of 32 Squadron's original complement, they were down to eight pilots. Within two days, they would be sent north by doubting. 
Still, the bombers managed to hit airfields, ships, and cause general terror. Following up this raid was a smaller one that made for Dover. This was Kesselring at his best. This follow-up raid was mostly unmolested on its approach, and so was able to cause significant damage at Dover. Hey everyone, Ray here. I've never told you this before, but I live in a cove. It's very nice, but everyone around me is retired, and they spend hours every day on their lawn, which always leaves my yard bringing up the rear. But now I have a ringer, that being Sunday Lawn Care. This year will be different. Yes, spring is here, and it's time to get the lawn ready and keep it looking great. Again, I'll be leaning on Sunday to help me, and if you should give them a try, like me, you'll not have to worry about chemicals. Your lawn will look great, and your family will be safe. Because Sunday can help you grow a beautiful lawn without the guesswork or the nasty chemicals. Here's how it works. When I signed up for Sunday, their lawn analysis tools created a personal nutrient plan delivered right to my door when I need it. They send the packages, I attach them to my garden hose, and spray. I'm done in less than 15 minutes. No more hard work. Instead, I'm working smarter. And you can too. And Sunday is offering our listeners 20% off. Full season plans start at just $129, and you get 20% off at checkout when you visit GetSunday.com slash World War II. That's 20% off your custom plan at GetSunday.com slash World War II. That night, the pressure was kept up by the Luftwaffe, with night bombing being widespread from the airfield in Montrose, Scotland, to the west and south. However, the main focus that night was in the Midlands. With the relative safety of night bombing, Sperla wanted to get his bombers north of London. The idea was to make it clear that no part of the home island was safe. London was under a red light warning that night as bombers flew around and near the city's vicinity. But the pilots, mindful of Gehring's threat, did a better job of avoiding the capital. Still, docks, factories, movie theaters, and personal property were hit and destroyed. As morning came, the damage was assessed, the dead, of which there were at least 85, were buried. The 200 or so wounded were treated. Life and the war went on. Aircraft losses for the day were 16 for the RAF and 20 for the Luftwaffe. Total reported losses to date were 297 and 574, respectfully. This almost parity in losses did not sit well with doubting. Fighter Command could not survive a slugfest with the Luftwaffe. He knew the reasons probably came down to sheer exhaustion and the condensed training period, but little could be done about that now. Bringing the air war down to a personal level, Czech pilot Count Manfred Zernin, flying a Hurricane of 17 Squadron, shot down three ME-110s within one minute. Clearly, the foreign pilots were coming along, and Dowling activated more of them, hoping to relieve some of the strain on the British pilots. As for Bomber Command, it was decided to pay Berlin back in kind for the bombing of London the night before. So, 81 Hadley Page Hamden bombers were sent up to bomb the Templehof airfield, while another group, consisting of Wellington bombers, made for the Siemens Housk factory. However, the cloud cover denied them any accurate bombing, so the Hamptons did the best they could. They jettisoned their bombs, but only managed to hit a summer house in the Berlin suburb of Rosenthal, and two people were injured. Gehring was embarrassed, as he swore Berlin would never be bombed. But Hitler was furious. What no one knew at the time was that Pandora's box had just been opened. On the high seas, supplies, the lifeblood of any island nation, were becoming thin, 
as at least nine British steamers were either sunk or made unusable for the foreseeable future. Along with these losses, at least 153 crew or naval staff were killed, with many more being injured. On Monday, August 26th, clouds hung over Britain, but the weather was a bit fairer over the Channel. It would have to do. Time was running out on Kesselring, and he was focused, but not too worried yet. His reconnaissance flights that morning told him of numerous planes on the ground at Kenley and Biggin Hill, and he had gone through most of his ideas. So, he adopted the wise plan thought out by General Lozer of Flieger Corps II. Large formations of German bombers and their escorts would fly over northern France and the Channel, and of course be seen by British radar. But what Park nor Downing could know was that some of them were flying only to distract the plotters. Some would cross the channel, but were only feints, and some would actually be the real thing. And to add another element of frustration for the British, the first two could and would develop into a real attack if the opportunity presented itself. This tactic reduced the reaction time the RAF pilots had to work with, significantly. And this tactic was already working in that Park felt his pilots were not engaging enough bandits relative to the number sent over the channel. But he couldn't ask his men for more sorties. Almost all were flying at least three a day, and some, or most, more than that. By 11.30 that morning, just over 100 bombers and their escorts broke from the formations flying over the Grizzny area and headed for the Fighter Command airfields at Folkestone and Dover. The Germans then separated into five raiding parties to confuse the British fighters rising up to meet them. One of the squadrons to give challenge was the newly arrived 616. They were newbies and paid the price as they came in too low, focusing on the bombers. They were quickly bounced by the higher-flying ME-109s. Within minutes, seven of their aircraft were gone from the sky, with two pilots dead and four more wounded. 264 Defiant Squadron joined in the fray, but lost three more of their planes. However, they managed to take a few Dorniers with them. Overall, it was a victory for the British, as the bombers turned around before reaching most of their primary targets as their escorts had to return home due to fuel. The air combat, before their targets could be reached, used up more fuel than expected. The five raiding parties were on their way home by 12.50 p.m. Another large raid would approach the southeast by 2.30 that afternoon. But before then, many reconnaissance flights and feints were launched further to the southwest. Of course, 10 Group's leader, Lee Mallory, couldn't know that they were feints, and this probably explains why he didn't help 11 Group more. Park was very clear about wanting help from 10 and 12 Group to relieve his pilots so they could focus on air combat only. On more than one occasion, when Park asked Lee Mallory for help, that help would come too late as the leader of 10 Group believed it was best to first form up an overwhelming force and then to proceed. And while no one likes to be outnumbered, daring and cunning seem to play a larger role than strength most of the time. By 2.44 p.m. that afternoon, a large formation of at least 190 bombers and their escorts left the Calais area and headed across the channel. Their goals were the airfields at Hornchurch and Debden, both north of the Thames on the east side of London. Park simply had no choice and sent up everything he had. Again, the combat that ensued used up more fuel than German planners counted on, and it wasn't long before the ME-109s had to turn back. Again, they would not make their targets. However, Six German bombers decided to keep going unescorted, 
and defying the odds, did extensive damage to Debden. The British had their own heroes that day as well. 85 Squadron, led by Peter Townsend, with his flight commander, Patrick Wood Scotland, right behind him, who was the brother of the almost blind Tony Wood Scotland we've talked about previously, flew head-on right into a group of bombers. The bombers scattered, and with no collective defense, eight of their number were lost. The Canadian squadron, activated just a week ago, made their debut, but lost three aircraft and had one pilot killed. In desperation, Park called on 12 Group for help. But 310 Squadron had their radios on the wrong frequency and got there late. Though they did manage to take out three bombers when they arrived. 19 Squadron also responded, but never found the raiders in the clouds and spent their time flying around in frustration. The German bombers who made it back wasted no time in letting Kesselring know of their displeasure about the escort situation. They claimed that the fighter pilots were more concerned about their fuel gauges, and who can blame them, than the mission or the bombers that could win this war. Kesselring was done for the day. It was now Sperle's turn further west. Around 4 p.m., he launched what would be his last major daytime raid for the next three weeks. 55 Heinkels, escorted by 100 fighters, were soon headed for Portsmouth. 11 Group responded with 5 squadrons, and 10 Group with 3. Everyone in the air was exhausted, but, for now, focused on the skies around them, and focused on getting home alive. Despite the 2 to 1 ratio of escorts to bombers, the British fighters were able to harass the escorts to a draw. That is, until their fuel started to run low. When they headed for home, the British then threw themselves at the bombers, who were soon frustrated and found themselves heading for home. In truth, the defender's job was made easier by late-day clouds moving in. Two smaller raids followed, but the same pattern held. Daytime activities ended, with German seaplanes being plotted in the area looking for survivors. They were escorted, so British fighters rose and chased them away. The day ended with one of the seaplanes being shot down. That night, Bomber Command ordered attacks on Leipzig, Luna, Hanover, and Nordhausen, along with two cities in Italy. Sperla's bombers were busy as well, trying to find North Weald, North Holt, and Hornchurch. Their goals were to destroy the industrial centers and airfields, the lifeblood of modern air war. As this was going on, Churchill stood outside Number 10 Downing Street in his golden dragon dressing gown to see or hear what he could. The next morning, he sent a note to the chief of air staff that said, Now that they have begun to molest the capital, I want you to hit them hard and Berlin is the place to hit them. Mine lane sorties were plotted to the south, east, and far north, but no interceptions were made. And finally, on the 26th, at least two British merchant ships were sunk, and three more were greatly damaged. Each ship suffered casualties. Losses for the day were 31 for the RAF and 41 for the Luftwaffe. Total losses to date were 328 and 615, respectively. The first anniversary of the war was coming up, but before then, civilians in the German capital would be dead from British night bombers. Hitler, enraged, would change the course of the war by ordering the unrestricted bombing of London. The British would be brought to their knees. In fact, the invasion would probably not be needed at all. There would be nothing left to invade.
Greetings, everyone from Central Virginia. Um, first, I just wanted to let everyone know that yes, my Yahoo account was hacked into. So if you got an email from me, um, it wasn't from me unless you responded to me first. Um, so please be careful. So I've gotten Paul Finch to set up a new email address for me. And this one is just ray at World War Two podcast dot net. Um, the World War spelled out and the two is just a Roman numeral two. So you can email me there. You can use the Yahoo if you want. I've uh, cleaned it up and taken care of all that. But if you don't feel safe, I understand. And I really do appreciate everyone's emails. So please don't stop sending them to me. So use either one. I'll check both every day. Um, I wanted to ask everyone if they've heard of the term trekkers. Uh, no, not Star Trek or anything like that, but uh, people who were in cities that were bombed that found themselves unable to sleep or relax in cities anymore. And at night they would head out of their car or whatever and they would sleep in the woods or they would sleep out in the country or away from the cities just because it was too much for them. So I stumbled across that, um, but I couldn't find too much. And uh, so if you've heard of that term and you know of any more information, um, please send me an email. Um, I would really appreciate it. I just wanted to learn about that as much as I could. And I'll end with um, 55. Episode 55 is coming out soon. Um, I'm going to try to do shorter, more frequent uh, episodes. And uh, we're now getting to the third phase um, of the Battle of Britain where everyone switches to bombing cities and and all the uh, the ramifications therein. I won't um, spoil it for you. Uh, but that will be coming soon. And now that I'm back from my trip and my life is getting back to normal with my email being hacked, hopefully you will hear from me um, a lot more frequently. Oh, sorry, one last thing. I recently did a second interview with Paranormal A Radio uh, talking about Hitler, the evil of Hitler, and some of the archaeological digs, the Holy Grail, that kind of thing. Um, so you can do a search, I'm sure, under Paranormal A Radio, and the A is E-H question mark. Um, dot com, or you could probably go to um, iTunes and do the same search. But it's a pretty interesting show. I think you'll like it. And then you'll have this one as well. So it's like having two shows in the same week. So maybe um, some of you will forgive me. So everyone take care, and I will see you as soon as I can.